Hello, welcome to Fiber Trek. My name is Sarah. Things are a little different, you may have noticed if you're new to the podcast. And I won't bore you with the mundane details of that, but I took advantage of the fact that I've rearranged a little bit and I wanted to put together a podcast before I left to go south. So here we are. So welcome, you're most welcome here. I hope that 2019 has kicked off um, to a good start for you. It certainly has for me. I love um, dark, cold nights and days and lots of snow and not having to go anywhere and skiing with my dog and stitching. So everything that I love about life, uh, I've got to experience in the first days of the year, um, including um, lots of wildlife sightings. I had a mink uh, encounter and uh, last weekend um, lots of people ice fish on this pond where I live in Maine. I'm in the north woods up by Katahdin which is the terminus of the Appalachian Trail and right near the Canadian border. Anyway lots of people ice fish. They leave the pickerel on the ice for the eagles uh, typically. It's kind of an invasive species and has really um, impacted our trout populations. <clears throat> All the same, we tend to leave the pickerel out. And uh, so I was getting ready to go skiing and I got in my car in this little brown mink. Um, they're kind of like larger ferrets. And <clears throat> ran across the ice to these fish that were frozen by the old ice fishing holes of our neighbors. And the eagles had already been there this in the morning, bald eagles. <clears throat> anyway, he was like just hell-bent for leather to get that fish. Of course, they're frozen <laughs> solid, rock solid, and he's, you could see him jumping up and down, and I just, I felt for the guy, so, um, so we were both, both, I was outside, and Rob was inside, and we were both watching him, and then the eagles flew over, and I do try to uh, welcome all life cycles <laughs> here, anyway, I just said that day in particular, I felt like luck was on that mink side, every once in a while, you need a little uh, help and support from guardians and allies, and so, <laughs> I ran out on the ice and he ran back into his hole on the bank here. And I went over and I kicked up the fish <clears throat> and I carried the fish back to his hole. And when I got there, he was peeking out of the bank. And I thought for sure he would have run off, <clears throat> but I, um, and, he, and he ran out towards me. And they can be really tenacious and um, it's not something you really want to mess around with, <laughs> even though they're kind of little. It's what I admire about squirrels, too, little red squirrels, and everybody hates them because they decimate their feeders, but man, those things, they know how to survive. I mean, anyway, so I digress. Uh, so I chucked the pickerel. I brought back four fish for him. I chucked the pickerel up towards the hole, and, um, and he ran out and got it, grabbed it, and ran back in. I mean, I was probably within 10 or 12 feet of this animal, and they tend to be a little bit more um, elusive than red squirrels which sit right here and chatter at me and sometimes even try to attack me for peanuts but um, so that was really an amazing and wonderful way to start the year it's literally I don't know five minutes later the eagles were still out in the ice the juvenile they look a little different than the adults they don't have a white head and white tail flew over and dropped a pickerel head in front of Rob and I on the ice and I was like this is a positive way. This is a really, these are great messages. <laughs> so um, all that to say, I've had a number of wonderful things happen to kick off 2019 and I'm really enjoying my time this winter <clears throat> with my dog and uh, my husband and being up on the pond here in Maine. Uh, that just, and I've been doing a lot of crafting. So I got to do that. I got the wildlife encounters. I got snow and skiing. I've got hot chocolate. I've got soup. I've got you know, my family, and now we're going to talk about the hand stitching that I've been doing. So, <clears throat> I primarily am going to talk about the Hedgewitch shawl that I've been knitting. Um, we also have, uh, I did a segment on the felt work and hand stitching I've been doing, and I'm going to insert that and talk all about that in a separate little segment. And I also have a segment from Rob, who's going to talk about his knitting and his adventures for March, uh, for well, March 2019 and beyond. And then I'm going to probably wrap it up for today so I can get on the road. I'm really excited. Um, driving isn't always my favorite thing to do, 
but I've been listening to Lord of the Rings, and so I'm looking forward to my drives now. I can get in and like three hours of Hobbit and Aragorn adventure. So um, anyway, I used to, dr I, well, dread is kind of a strong word. Anyway, I'm looking forward to listening to Lord of the Rings when I finish with po the podcast. So I cast on <laughs> the Hedge Witch shawl. And on December 22nd, I knit, I don't know, 10 repeats. And last night or two nights ago, I um, there's a beautiful uh, hairy woodpecker sitting outside our um, on our porch. This happens quite often when I sit here. So, uh, and <clears throat> so I happen to be texting with Nicole of the Jen Knitter podcast, who I am co-hosting this knit along with. And I was kind of bemoaning the fact that I really wasn't happy with the texture of my shawl. And, you know, I really felt like I should go up a needle size to kind of achieve that big, cozy, oversized kind of blanket that I wanted. And she was like, yeah, you probably need to rip it out. I don't have a problem ripping out things. And I was like, you know what? You're exactly right. I just need to get what I want and embrace failure. And as um, Wendell Berry says, the poet and author of the American Poet and Author, um, embrace uh, or practice resurrection, which all seemed apropos of this moon to moon uh, knit along, right? So everything waxes and wanes, everything comes and goes, as does your knitting. And so what... Um, is ripped will be re-knit and new again. So embracing that kind of failure and uh, allowing and practicing uh, resurrection, which is a really great thing to practice with knitting versus other trials and tribulations that life throws at us. So anyway, here is my Hedge Witch. And I am knitting this uh, with the Wool Wife yarn from Starcroft. This is Two Ply Romney from Bybrook Farm. And it's part of the Wool Wife line that I'm kind of a co-conspirator on with Janie of Starcroft. And it's, this label is just a way to tell other stories, uh, other yarn stories, um, and feature other places and landscapes <clears throat> in, um, uh, versus just the Nash Island clip. So, um, so I'm knitting the main color in the gray, and which is a pewter, and I'm going to do the contrasting color in a really like warm, vibrant, fiery, uh, but m not like, not like Julie fire, more like earth burnt fire uh, red in her osier colorway, which is a Nash Island uh, yarn. So I went to a US 9, <clears throat> and I've finished five repeats, I think, and I'm already liking the way the fabric is working out. You can just see that slight bit of texture. It's been really enjoyable to follow everybody along with the hashtag, and I've been trying to uh, look at that and comment as much as possible. Um, there's some really uh, just beautiful kind of dedication uh, moments, people pulling a card or um, taking just taking a specific amount of time, and, and then, of course, beautiful uh, fibers and... Um, just, just something kind of a really, uh, just a meaningful engagement um, online. So I'm, move, you know, doing my thing with this shawl, and it's all I'm committed to working on um, till it's finished. I am really excited because I'm working with Christina of Matterroot. Um, I've commissioned her to do a series of her Moon Phases linen bags. I've also put together... Uh, some pins with uh, Nicole's original artwork. So those are all coming and I will keep you posted on some of the other uh, treasures that Nicole and I are gonna be releasing as part of the celebration of this particular shawl. So thank you for participating. I know Nicole has been keeping up with people in her Ravelry group uh, and I've been trying to manage the Instagram group. Let's see, anything else I need to say about hedge witching? I don't think so. I will. I do want to point out that uh, Amy Beth of the Fat Squirrel is knitting the Hedge Witch shawl, and I'm a big fan of the podcast. And I tuned into her bonus episode. Uh, I can't remember the full title of it, but it is 
something with Nip Worthy. And she talks a lot about uh, self and the body and caring for our body and body image and the overculture here uh, that we kind of manage in um, the Western world. And I thought it was really interesting and great kind of food for thought. And I would encourage you to head on over to her. Well, regardless of uh, that bonus episode. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just felt like that coincided really nicely with some of the work I've been doing during this particular knit along. And, uh, and I obviously we just want to give Amy Beth a huge shout out, uh, not only for the great work she does on her podcast, but um, the great opportunity she provides for people to be reflective about larger issues that coincide with our handcrafting. So go Amy Beth. Um, what else? I feel like, I think I'm going to, uh, let go of that and move on. I'm going to um, send you over to myself uh, talking about the felt work. And then on the other side of that, I'll come back and then we'll send you out to the skiing portion of our video. Come back and then I'll wrap it up. So let's head on over and learn a little bit about the felt belt. Okay. So I know that I've been posting quite a bit about my stitching on Instagram, so I thought that I would talk a little bit about that project and my intention for it and show you a little bit of my hand stitching. I've got quite a bit of blanket stitching to do, as you'll see. Um, so this project is um, inspired by my husband's trip. Um, Paddle to the Sea, uh, some of you may know, or Rob. He is headed to Greenland for a uh, ski adventure. I think it is the world's coldest ski race. So he's going to average about 30 kilometers a day, and it's over three days, and uh, it's in uh, western Greenland in March. And as people who live in a colder climate, uh, it is imperative to both of us that we dress appropriately and layering systems and we each have our systems of how we want to control temperature because when you're exercising especially exercising outside when it's cold and you're sweating you want to really minimize the amount of moisture you produce and if you're producing a lot of moisture then you want to be wearing clothing that can um, hold the moisture ventilate the moisture and also when it's wet keep you warm which is why wool is the ultimate uh, material for um, being warm when you're wet and cold because it will do that it's insulatory and it will maintain its insulatory properties even when it's wet so we think a lot about this stuff uh, so when dressing for these types of activities outside in such cold climates um, there's a lot of different layering systems that you can um, implement to kind of help manage that one of the systems that I've used in the past is just like a cowl I have wrapped a shawl around my middle um, where my kind of long john and under trouser meet my shirt um, and then this goes underneath like an outer shell jacket and again it's just to trap heat those places where heat can leak out um, and cold can penetrate but also it allows you to um, ventilate pretty easily. So just like a cowl, you can take the cowl off, let it hang, you can pull it up over your mouth. Um, they have a lot of multiple uses. Uh, so this particular project is going to be a cummerbund, if you will, felt belt, that's what I'm calling it, to go around Rob's waist where his trousers and his shirt come together to help manage and trap heat. And obviously I wanted to hand stitch a little bit of magic into it. So I've, um, I've sourced my resources kind of with intention and, um, and I've put together some design work. So this is all my own work and my own thought process. I didn't use a pattern. Uh, I did use inspiration from some of the books I showed you in my last felt kind of studio blog, but um, everything else is my own. Um, the, this bear, so this is going to, you can see how with the under piece here and the clasp will go here. I'm just using, I'll go grab it. I'm just using a silver frog so you can see it here. So that's just going to sit here 
and he'll be able to um, easily get it on and off without having to wrap. Mine was a wrap that I used, so I had to like tuck it in and fiddle with it, but this will be, I think, a little bit more convenient. So, um, yeah, so I'm just going to blanket stitch this on and then, um, but you can see there's a bear. This is my own felt from my Icelandic. Um, I did myself. And then I cut out from 100% felt. This is considered a craft weight felt. I think it's a sixteenth of an inch, whereas you can see this is much thicker. Um, I cut this out using the freezer pepper freezer pepper freezer paper method I uh, highlighted on Instagram, and then I blanket stitched all the raw edges, and then I just did some floral stitching. This is representative of a compass rose. Again, I used my felt. All of the stitching that you see is 100% wool thread from Spain. It's called Moiro thread, M-O-I-R-E. And I have quite a few colors because I just couldn't decide. They're beautiful. I was looking for my spool, which has... Oh, I'll put it back. So... Um, this particular color is 116. And then, I haven't done this side yet, but I'm getting ready to do my bear. So I thought I would stitch a little bit on my bear, and you guys can see me do my blanket stitch. It's been really fun to think about the pieces that are going on the belt and the meaning that they have. and uh, So I've really enjoyed the thought process behind this particular project. Um, and here's hoping. I have to admit, I'm not like super uber um, conscientious of spacing and stuff like that. So here's kind of hoping that these are equal. Uh, let's see. So I'm just using a blanket stitch, and I'm dump and I'm using the the thread double oops, double threaded or doubled. So let's see how we do here. And I got sent when I ordered, I think I ordered a pack from Front Porch Quilts of this thread. And they sent me a, a pack of chenille needles. And that's been really helpful using the wool thread because it does a braid when it's going through. So using a uh, couple tip, a couple uh, techniques will help kind of preserve the longevity of your thread. At least I found one is obviously with wool pulling from um, a shorter distance. Obviously as you get longer and longer out, plus I have two uh, here, the more opportunity there is for it to break. And the other was um, put forth by a, by a viewer on my last um podcast, which is to use a larger eye needle to create an, a larger opening for the yarn to, the thread to go through. So I've done both those things. I, I will say for this particular um, piece on the thicker wool, my, you can see how, how thick my personal felted wool is. It's similar to this thickness. Um, I'm using a larger eye, but when I did my stitching for the florals, I did use a smaller needle um, just to get a little bit more control of um, placement. So,
And I love to blanket stitch. <laughs> I had thought I would decorate the bears, but I like them kind of just plain. You'll see that I did add um, ears, eyes, and a nose. And yeah, I was going to put a bunch of design on here, but I opted not to. So I'll see. I don't know if I'll do anything here, but right now I'm going to just focus on getting the bear on, the Celtic knot on, and then figuring out what I want to do. Um, I'll do a matching set of florals on the other Celtic knot as well. Uh, let's see. I've also been able to use some of my stash. So the gray on the floral here, this is my Shackleton yarn. And I brought out, I have my own Icelandic yarn. I thought I might use that to blanket stitch it onto the, to blanket stitch the edge of the blue felt to finish that edge. And I'm also going to be trying out Upton Yarns Three Ply Straws Island, and this is like an indigo dip that she did, just to see how that does as well. So there's lots of different materials you can pull in. Um, I got some wax thread from my husband um, to give that a try. I'm also going to order some, um, that's waxed linen thread. I'm going to order some non-waxed linen thread and some silk threads just to see how they perform with this type of material. So um, I haven't, I, it's funny, like I use DMC for a lot of other things that I do. So, you know, all of this is like DMC and it's beautiful and I love working with it. Um, but I haven't, I don't know why, but I haven't used any or wanted to use any of the DMC on this particular piece. And so I'm looking for alternative natural, you know, types of uh, strong fibers like linen and silk to use. Um, but not to say there isn't room for more opportunity. So, but yeah, I think what I like um, about the wool threads is it's aesthetic and that it's a little bit more subtle. Um, they just, so the whole thing looks cohesive to me. And um, I think the DMC is like a punch because it's, it's a little bit glossier and it, so it's a little bit silkier. And so in, in its look and so, um, I just, I'm like, I just, I'm loving this, this type of palette. I have lots more colors because I just could not help myself. What a rabbit hole to fall down. But, so that's what I'm making. And uh, I'm going to make one for myself next once this one is done. So we'll see what creative endeavors move forward from, from this. I'm really, really enjoying it. Right, so <clears throat> I'm really, as I probably stated in that video, I've just really been engaged in this project. It's one of the most creative endeavors I've ever embarked on, and uh, because it's so multifaceted, um, and I just have to pick a yarn and pick a sweater, um, there's more, there's the stitching, there's the materials, there's uh, the... That's the word I'm looking for. The process of managing those materials. So I've learned a lot and I've really been um, invigorated by this particular project and I can't wait to make my own. That being said, I've gone ahead and ordered <clears throat> a couple more books and I'll be sharing those with you on the next podcast um, to kind of expand uh, my skill sets with that particular um, craft. What else? We, I, I'm actually wearing my hat because we just got back from skiing. I'm going to send you over there in a minute. And uh, we went out on the ice today. And I really, I really enjoy skiing on the ice. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to ski in the woods up here. Beautiful groomed trails. Um, but 
as much as I, I love to, I love trees and I love being in the woods, I do love being out on wide open landscapes. And so being on the ice for me is just really inspiring. There's lots of sun and it, there's just the width and breadth of, um, of the, I don't know what I'm getting at, but I just love the openness. I love the openness of Montana and the moors and the islands of Scotland. And so those are places that really attract me. And so getting out on the ice is one of my favorite things to do, especially at night. And you can hear it uh, moving and shifting. It's kind of like a rumble and you get really great stars. Uh, it's just a really unique and special experience. Uh, if you ever get the chance to get out on an icy lake in the winter, I would highly recommend it. So Rob and I took Ruby skiing and we did a little recording where Rob's going to talk about his uh, his knitting. So I'll send you out there and then we'll come back. So Rob and I thought it would be fun to kind of come out on our ski with us. Uh, setting up the tripod and managing the camera with my skis on is really interesting. Rob is currently attached to Ruby. I just thought I'd show you that little studio over there. That's the little cabin I want to buy so Rob can come down in the mornings and start my fire and then I can do all my stitching and stashing in there. And this is at the end of our pond. We're skiing on the ice today. I think we can get we can get Ruby. There's Rubes. Hey, Rocket Dog. Anyway, I thought I'd have Rob come and talk to you about his knitting and thanks for taking off your glacier glasses and his uh, project. The only thing you might have to do, Rob, is ski up to the camera with your knitting. Okay. Do you need me to get that? Yeah. So you guys get to watch us kind of bumble around. We're not taking off our skis. I'm hopefully going to get in the picture. So I'll talk a little bit about the ski trip I have planned for the spring. Where are you going to wear your felt belt? I'm going to wear my felt belt and a pair of socks that I'm knitting right now that Sarah's pulling out for me. These are three-ply coops worth, up in yarn. And the <laughs> pattern is Whiskey Bay Woolens Walkerville. So I think and, she's uh, out of Australia, I yep, think. Yep. And as long can as you flip the camera thing so I can see what we're looking at? If you're still attached to Ruby. I'm attached to the dog, so you, okay. everybody has to stand by. So um stand by, so stand by. it's been slow knitting, so on US twos. So a bit get a little closer so you can see. There yeah. we go. Yep, so three ply coops worth. Um I'm working on it, so these are going to be one of the pairs of socks that I wear during the the event. So and it's a broken rib pattern, so that it's got some nice texture and elasticity to it. <clears throat> and what else are you using? Your homespun, that's yep. from Scotland. From Furzness, yeah. Furzness Farms. The Highlander. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, so that's the start of it. So hopefully we get get cruising along on this. And and you were going to knit a pair of socks for each day of the race. Right, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> I'm on day 36 of ski training, so instead of knitting, I'm skiing. So that, that's, that's where so all my energy pair. is. One pair. And then probably some other socks that I've knit in the past. So. And you can, I'll put that away so we don't lose okay. it, or you don't lose any stitches, because that could be the end of the... That would be very yeah. sad. <laughs> it so. doesn't ever bode well for our marriage when you lose stitches, and I have to stop. And Ruby Dog, come over here. I encourage Rob to be personally accountable and empower him to take come on, care of his knitting. Over here, Ruby. Ruby, come. Good girl. Um, okay. But, Sometimes I need help. So, I, um, mis I mistakenly said you were doing 30 kilometers a day for this race, but... So, yeah. So, the race is 160 Good. kilometers over three days. So, it's a little over 50 kilometers a day. 30, 30 plus miles um, is what we'll be skiing per day. The interesting part of it for me is I'm not a racer or a competitor. I'm going with a friend um, just to experience skiing, you know, above the Arctic Circle for three days. And the interesting part that I like about it is we'll be camping out. So cooking our own meals, you know, having a sleeping bag. I'm bringing my minus 40 Fahrenheit down sleeping bag. Um, so that'll be plenty toasty warm on those cold, cold nights. Is it the world's coldest ski race? Is that it what is. it's yep. as? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it's called the, um, the, the Arctic Circle Race. So. Yeah. And did you, you, it's in Western Greenland, right? Yes. Yeah, West Central. I'm going to try to yep. put a map in just to give you a little geographic context. Um, it was really lovely. The, uh, Laka from Fiber Tales did a geographic lesson on Denmark <clears throat> when it was really, <laughs> it was really helpful and interesting to have her talk about that locale. And I believe Greenland um, is part of the Denmark government yes, type of yep. 
um, kingdom. And on the flight over, I'm going to Copenhagen. I know, so it's a big deal. Hopefully... Rob's first European city, continental European city, because yes. you've been to Edinburgh. I, I, I go to Canada all the time, yeah. so that's but, my preferred So it's going to be so. very, very European. Yeah. Uh, maybe find some fiber. Some maybe, but I'm looking for more day. for interesting Greenland, Greenlandic stuff, so okay. we'll see. Yep. Um, but anything else you want so, to add to? Well, that, that, yeah, that's, that's sort of my game. So. We're gonna Ruby's starting to hold up her paws, so I think she's getting cold, or she's just getting impatient. Maybe you can get a picture of us skiing. So I, will, yeah, maybe I'll get a little footage of Ruby Rocket, and, uh, and then we'll we'll finish up our ski for the day. All right, I'll see you when we get back. Bye. Uh -huh. So you got a chance to see us in action, and hence this is the reason I'm <laughs> quite like this. And uh, I think that I'm going to put together just a couple comments about the Wolf Scouts retreat that's coming up, and um, yeah, and then bid you a fond farewell. So the Wolf Scouts retreat is held at Bradford Camps. <clears throat> it will be the week of August 10th through the 18th. There's two sessions in there, August 10th to the 14th and 14th to the 18th. I'm going to be uploading all the information to my website, um, and you can find the link uh, down below, or you can find it in my Instagram uh, profile. That will include cost and be more descriptive of kind of the general atmosphere of Bradford camps. Um, but it is an old sporting camp run by Igor and Karen Sikorsky. Uh, it's a family style meal plan, so they make all the meals. And um, there's running water, hot water, showers, toilets, and a beautiful lake. Uh, it's really m accessible mostly by float, paint, float plane, and so it's just a real sense of adventure about the place and a real sense of tradition and history about um, regarding the North Woods and the state of Maine. So we will be welcoming back Mary Jane Mucklestone and we'll be welcoming Janie Estelle of Starcroft Fiber. She's come every year. Myself, I'll be teaching a little, um, a short workshop. Janie will be teaching a short workshop and I'm excited that Nicola the Gentle Knitter will be joining us to teach uh, a enrichment workshop as well. So <clears throat> those are kind of the technique people. It's not really driven by um, learning and instructing. It's more driven by, hey, let's try this out and see what happens kind of mentality. Um, there's opportunities for fly fishing and canoeing and you can look back. I have videos and I know that Ninja Chickens, Maria of Ninja Chickens podcast did a beautiful video. So if you're interested in seeing and kind of getting a feel for the experience, both of those would be good resources for you. Let's see. I am getting ready for Edinburgh Yarn Festival. Uh, that's happening in three months. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. I am also really excited. Rob and I are going to Sweden. Uh, I wanted to throw that out there because I think we're going to try to spend a day in Stockholm. I don't know if I have any viewers out there who are in the area, um, but I will be I will be heading on to Gotland and spending some time on Gotland. And I haven't sorted it all out, but we'll be out and about in Sweden. And so I'm looking for in, insider information. So if you are a resident and you've got good information for Rob and I, what we should and should get out and do and see and eat. Eating is very important. I'm a big foodie traveler type. Um, then I would definitely welcome any recommendations or tips for traveling abroad in Sweden. With that, I think I'm going to say a fun farewell. I don't have any big acquisitions, and I'll share those next time. And, yeah, in the meantime, wherever your fiber trucks may take you, may you return home safe with lots of soulful stash. I'll see you next time. Bye. Sit in that seat.